Hello, this is Jie Xiong. Today, I will be joined by a British scholar, Martin Jack, a former senior fellow at the Department of Politics and International Studies at Cambridge University, and a Western expert on China. Hello, Martin. Hello.、Um, I know you have been observing China for such a long time, and recently China has been rallying for common prosperity and expanding on plans to reduce the income inequality, citing education,、uh, training, the internet, and urbanization as major vehicles in this drive. President Xi Jinping once said. Common prosperity is an essential requirement of、uh, socialism and a key feature of Chinese-style modernization. However, many voices in the West argue that common prosperity is just a new way for the Chinese government to tighten its grip, and that it may stifle China's economic dynamism and even drag down the global economy. So, how do you understand the concept of、uh, China's common prosperity initiative? Well, I think it's a very interesting、uh, development. One of the most important developments,、uh, in a way, since 1978,、mm-hmm. because uh, since 1978, uh, inequality has grown enormously、uh, in China. So uh, uh, this is a very important moment, in my view, in China's development, which is a new stage of modernization, which redefines、uh, modernization to embrace a notion of. Relative equity in the relationship between different parts of the population—that it's no longer that China's no the icons of China's development are no longer、uh, as they were to some extent or have been to some extent the rich or the super rich, and now to、uh, for in effect for China's development to be inclusive. That is, everyone shares in it, and everyone has a place in it, and everyone is important to it. And just because you've got money, shouldn't buy you exceptional privilege. Now, this is a very important moment, and I think one of the things that's most interesting about it, as you say in your question, is that the notion of common prosperity is very wide-ranging, and this is true because the sources of inequality are very wide-ranging. So, for example, it's not just about wealth; it's not just about income. It's also, for example, about access to education. Absolutely key question in China uh, uh, is the ability of the privileged to buy their kids、uh, much better education. For, for example, th-、uh, through tutoring, or through、uh, while、well, they're at school, or、uh, through private schools. And I think that the Chinese government is absolutely right to tackle this question head on. I mean, in, in my own country, this is a huge problem: private education. So you have to tackle. Uh, the problems of inequality in lots of different ways. Well, the Western response has been not that interested, actually.、Uh, it, been, it has been mildly interested, interested, but not very much so. So the the commentary has been, you know, bordering on the negative. Yes, that's true. But all commentary on China at the moment in the West is basically negative. So that's not a source of surprise to us.、Uh, but actually, it's also a problem for the West. Because if China successfully tackles this problem, then it raises the question in the West: Well, why haven't you done anything about inequality? Because ever since、uh, around about 1980 and the development of neoliberalism and so on in the West, inequality has grown enormously, right across the West. There's not an exception in the West. The most brutal example is the United States, and inequality is not something which is,、uh, you know, ignored. Because it's a major political source of、uh, of debate and argument in the West. So if China sets that example, I think this then poses the question: Well, what about you in the West? Right. So as you mentioned, addressing those inequality is a difficult problem for governance in many countries. So, what do you think are the、um, biggest differences between China's policies and those of the Western countries? The main difference is China's addressing it and doing something about it, and the West is really doing very little. The reason you get a situation like this over time—I mean, there's partly some material objective factors that lead to it—but there's also a big problem, which is the problem of vested interests.、Uh, whereas in China, what's impressive, I think, about Xi's announcement 
and you know the rapid way in which the development the, these reforms are being announced and so on is that china is not facing this problem there were, of course there are vested interests in china which wouldn't want, want this to happen for example those who are relatively privileged but the 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 emphasis of society is on common prosperity and i'm sure that's what's going to happen um, you predicted China's rise early, actually, and you published a bestseller named uh, "When China Rules the World: The Rise of China and the Decline of the West." So, how do you see the Western attitudes towards China's rise over these years, changing over these years? Is it gradual acceptance, or is it extremely maladaptive, or even confrontational? Right. Well, I think that what we've seen. Is um, three phases since 1978. Uh, the first phase phase was uh, largely to ignore it, um, to regard uh, China's reforms as uh, defeat the defeat of socialism, uh, the embrace of the market. So basically, China was Westernizing. So that's the first phase, and that probably lasted until I would say the late the mid late 1990s. And then you have a new phase from the late 1990s when people begin to really appreciate China's is changing. China is growing, huge reduction in poverty, um, and uh, a feeling in the West that maybe this offers the West new opportunities. And this was the second phase, and the second phase was, I would say, near optimistic or nearly optimistic, <laughs> but certainly, but certainly curious. And more open-minded than it had been before. You know, maybe China's rise is in our interests, if you like. And then the third phase comes basically with Trump in 2016, and this led. This was the moment of the redefinition of China as no longer not an opportunity but a threat.、Mm. In other words, that China's rise had been so successful, which they'd never expected. It had developed. It was developing a major, broader presence in the world, political, diplomatic, and so on. And China was a threat to、uh, America's position as the global global hegemon. And that then the whole attitude flipped actually very rapidly into a sort of more like a Cold War mentality. And that has very strongly influenced、uh, opinion across the West. It's most rooted. And most、uh, aggressive in the United States, I can feel it strongly in my own country. Europe, less so. Europe doesn't regard itself any more to have any kind of global sort of aspirations as a hegemon or anything like that. So they don't see China as a threat in the same way as the United States. The United States is particularistic in this sense because it is the global hegemon. So the rise of China, of course, is. Uh, has been in a, a, over a, quite a time, steadily weakening uh, chi- uh, the United States' influence in the world.、Uh, have you anticipated the next phase? Will we? I think that uh, uh, this phase is going to last a while.、Uh, you know, I think that the, let's call it the Trump period,、mm-hmm. uh, because Biden's、uh, position on China is very similar to Trump's in, in other,、uh, as far as China is concerned. Um, and I think this is going to go on for a while. I, 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 I personally think it will last、uh, at least twenty years. I, I, it's very negative.、Uh, it's very disappointing.、Um, it's you know has has negative effects across the world,、um, but that's where we are at the moment. As we know, this year marks the centenary of the founding of the Communist Party of China. I understand there are many misconceptions about the Communist Party in the international community. While we Chinese actually think the governance is good, so how do you understand or explain this perception gap here?、Uh, well, it, 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 there is an enormous uh, uh, perception gap. You are absolutely right.、Okay. Um, The, the great problem in the West、uh, is that、um, the Chinese Communist Party is basically easily、uh, identified or,、uh, as, as a, 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 like, the, like the Soviet Communist Party. So this is a huge undergrowth of attitudes, if you like,、uh, 
uh, in the in the West over accumulated a very long period of time of uh, uh, where, where the Soviet Union, communist parties, the communist tradition was regarded as the enemy. But the problem, of course, is that people didn't really know in the West much about China anyway. I mean, you know, for 200 years, China was invisible, apart from us, you know, trampling on China in the 19th and early 20th century. But basically, you know, China was weak, China was poor, China was invisible. So we knew nothing about it. We didn't even need to learn uh, much about it. So in this, this development we've had since 2016, you've had this kind of, you know, collapse of curiosity, or no, too strong a word, this weakening of curiosity in the West about China, that inquiring mind, because the only way these kind of prejudices and preconceptions can be changed is if people are open to thinking about it in a different way. If they're not open to thinking about it in a different way, if they're, if they're pushed back into their prejudices, then you're stuck really, because the arguments really, I can assure you, take place at the most banal and uh, uh, irrational level about China. Of course you like your government, it's been extraordinarily successful. It's been absolutely brilliant uh, since 1949, especially since 1978. I mean, look what it's done. Uh, why not? But this is, you can obviously appreciate this firsthand, it's intimate to your lives. But for the Westerner who knows nothing about it beyond a very limited point, and who is unable really to read or see much about it, which can enlighten them, uh, then they come to it, you know, really uh, in darkness, uh, because where is the light uh, of enlightenment? It's not there. So the first thing is for them to be open, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, look, the, the situation has got worse. There's no question about that. You know, since, since, since Trump, you know, you've got this kind of closure, the closing of the Western mind. That's what happens after 2016. The fact that your governance system has performed so creditably, so marvelously over this period, is just not appreciated in the West. They've just got no inkling, no understanding of it, because it's all reduced to control, repression, and so on. It's it, it's a it's an extraordinary one-dimensional view of China. The relationship between China and the U.S. has always been the focus of international attention, and according to the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, the new administration's approach to China is to be competitive when it should be, and collaborative when it can be, and adversarial when it must be. And Biden himself also emphasized that stiff competition defines U.S.-China relations. However, China opposes defining these relations as competitive and calls for communication in an attitude of equality and mutual respect. So how do you see the Biden administration's China policy and how will the relationship between China and the U.S. develop, in your opinion? The relationship between the U.S. and China is defined primarily by rivalry and only secondarily by cooperation. Whereas previously, I would say it was probably defined by cooperation and only secondarily by rivalry. And that's been the big shift in the situation, I think. And I think this is going to continue uh, for quite a long time because America has shifted. It's not just Trump. It's not just Biden. It's American public opinion. This is a big groundswell of opinion has moved from one position. China is an opportunity to another position. China is a threat and that's not going to go quickly. These things don't when you get these shifts in eras, shifts in periods in relations and so on, they don't go away quickly. The Cold War lasted over 40 years. The, the, the stability in the relationship between China and the US very, uh, very good period you know, lasted 40 odd years, they last a long time. Um, and this period, I think, will, will last uh, uh, another, um, at least two decades. Why? The reason is because the United States has to come to a recognition that China is 
uh, here to stay. It is different. Is that a different? It has a different view of the world, and it has to come to accept this. It has the relationship must be based on one of mutual respect and equality. China is no longer the junior a junior player. China is in, in the same peer group as the United States. The United States has never hitherto recognised that. That was not the situation in the long period from 1972 to 2015. You know, before Trump, it was never like that because America always thought that China was the junior partner in the relationship. You know, it would never economically challenge the United States, and eventually it would westernise and become like a Western-style country. That's what they thought. Those were the two assumptions that underpinned the American attitude. And they and they were wrong. They were always wrong, and that's why America has shifted. Now America has to then come to the to the position that it has to treat China and respect China as its equal in the world. Now that requires a huge shift in public opinion at all levels in the United States. That's why it's going to take time, because it, America has got to work through that situation. And it is very traumatic for the United States. The United States has always thought of itself, for what、well, has long thought of itself, particularly in this since 1945, as you know, number one in the world. It's part of its DNA. So to let go of that situation, to begin to understand that it's no longer in that situation in the world, is going to be a long, painful process with many. Twists and turns. So that's why I think that this is going to go on for a long time, and we all have to kind of find ways of dealing with that and adapting to the situation. But it will, it won't go on forever. In the foreseeable future, in the immediate future, China is not going to be,、um, you know, the, 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 is is not going to surpass the United States in ways that have become absolutely clear and categorical. In twenty years. I would say that that will be the situation. That China, the Chinese economy will be twice the size of the American economy. America's influence in the world will be that much less, and so on. And so America has got to work through、uh, to a recognition that it's a new world, and America is no longer, you know, the unassailable number one in the world. But it has to share the world with China, and of course with everyone else at the same time, because、yeah. there are lots of other countries. Uh, in the world, that are doing well. Right. Thanks, Martin. Always great to pick your brand. So thank you very much.